Good afternoon, everyone. Before we begin, can I remind members that social distancing measures are in place in the Chamber and across the campus. So would members please take care to observe these measures over the course of this afternoon's business, including when entering and exiting the Chamber. The first item of business is First Minister's questions. And can I, for information, let members know that I'll be taking no supplementaries until after question seven. But members can press their buttons from the start of the session if they wish a supplementary later. And I invite the First Minister to make a brief statement. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll start with an update on the key statistics. As of nine o'clock this morning, 15,240 positive cases have been confirmed, which is an increase of 55 since yesterday. A total of 1,247 patients who are either suspected uh, or confirmed as having COVID-19 are in hospital, which is an increase of 47 since yesterday. However, the number of confirmed cases has decreased by 23. As of last night, 38 people were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected uh, COVID, which is an increase of three since yesterday. And I should point out that uh, yesterday's figure of 36 has been revised to 35. I'm afraid that in the past 24 hours, 13 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed as having the virus. That takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,304. However, National Records of Scotland has just published its more detailed weekly report. Uh, unlike the daily figures, its figures do not just include those deaths with a confirmed laboratory diagnosis. It also reports on cases where no formal test was carried out, but where the virus was entered on the death certificate as a suspected or contributory cause of death. Uh, the latest NRS report covers the period up until Sunday, the 24th of May, three days ago. At that point, according to our daily figures, uh, 2,273 deaths had been registered of people who had tested positive for the virus. However, today's report shows that by Sunday, the total number of registered deaths linked to COVID-19 confirmed and presumed was 3,779. 230 of those deaths were registered in, in the seven days up to Sunday. That is a decrease of 105 from the week before. And indeed, this is the fourth week in a row in which deaths have fallen. Deaths in care homes made up 54% of all deaths linked to the virus last week. That is down from 56% in the previous week. And the number of COVID-19 deaths in care homes also reduced again from 186 last week to 124 in the most recent week. However, of course, that figure remains too high. Finally, the total number of excess deaths, that is the number of deaths above the five-year average for the same time of year, also decreased from 357 to 178. I've said before, and it remains true, that these statistical trends will never console those who have lost loved ones to this virus, and my thoughts and sympathies are with each and every one of them. But these trends, which have now been sustained uh, for over four weeks, do definitely give us grounds for encouragement. The weekly number of COVID deaths has fallen by more than 60% from its peak. Excess deaths have reduced by more than three quarters, and deaths in care homes are also falling. Tomorrow, we'll take a formal decision on whether to begin cautiously to emerge from lockdown. Any early steps are likely to focus on outdoor activities, and we will provide full information on what individuals and businesses should and should not be doing. Uh, but I stress that even if some restrictions are relaxed later this week, it will continue to be essential to follow guidance. For example, to stay two metres apart from people from other households and to self-isolate if you have symptoms. And at the moment, the message in Scotland remains the same. Please stay at home except for essential purposes. When you leave the house, stay more than two metres from other people and don't meet up with those from other households. Please wear a face covering if you're in a shop or in public transport and remember to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. And again, let me remind people, if you or someone in your household has COVID-19 symptoms, you must stay at home and isolate completely. What we have all done so far has made a difference and today's figures show that. Everyone has played a part in slowing the spread of the virus, protecting the NHS and saving lives. I want to end by once again thanking everybody across Scotland for doing that, but also to stress that as we start to emerge from lockdown, that cooperation will become more important than ever. We'll now move to questions. Jackson Carlaw. Uh, Presiding officer, we now know that more than 900 patients were discharged from hospital to care homes in March before compulsory testing was announced on April the 21st, far more than the government previously suggested. 
Does the First Minister now know the total number of patients who were discharged from hospital to care homes without being tested? And is she satisfied that during that time the government did everything it reasonably could to protect care home staff and residents? First Minister. Uh, we have already published the figures for February and March. The figure quoted by Jackson Carlow is for March. The figure for April will be published on the 2nd of June in a few days' uh, time. Um, on the issues about care homes, there are been two uh, things suggested uh, about care homes, both of them uh, very serious and, and legitimate. One is that we shouldn't have discharged uh, older patients from hospital to care homes uh, and secondly that we should have tested more uh, before doing so and I can absolutely see uh, why uh, with everything we know now people uh, would look at those things and ask why that was done but I would invite people to look at the situation we faced at the time. Uh, on the first of these issues uh, old people who are uh, what is called delayed discharges, of course, do not need to be in hospital. Even in normal times, it's not in their interest to be there. But at the time we're talking about, we were waiting for a tsunami of coronavirus cases to enter our hospitals. And remember uh, the scenes we were seeing from Italy at that time. It would have been unthinkable uh, to leave older people there in the face of that. That would have put them at huge risk. And many, I am sure, would have died uh, in those circumstances. Um, and I think uh, I would be getting asked different questions right now. Secondly, on testing, um, at that time, the advice was that people uh, who did not have symptoms were not likely to spread the virus and that testing people without symptoms uh, was unreliable. And indeed, that latter point is still a concern to some extent. Uh, so if we apply what we know now to uh, that situation then, of course, we may take different decisions. But when we face these decisions, we have to act on the basis of the information we had. And based on that information, yes, we did everything possible uh, to protect older people, risk assessments of people leaving hospital and, of course, guidance to care homes about isolation. But on this, as on everything, we continue to adapt our response as the knowledge we have continues to develop. Jackson Carlo. Uh, the numbers we are talking about here are so considerable that we do sometimes forget we are talking about individuals. So let me mention just one. This week we were contacted by a lady in Glasgow called Sandra O'Neill. Her mother Mary sadly died from COVID-19 on April the 8th at the Almond Care Home in Drum Chapel. Sandra has nothing but good words to say about the frontline care staff who looked after her mother during the three years of her stay. But she does now have a series of questions about how her mother caught the disease. She says that in March, as in other care homes, there were examples of people who were in hospital who were returned to the home despite clearly being ill. She says there are those in the home who believe that at least one case, residents had symptoms consistent with COVID-19 when returned. Now we know the First Minister has just confirmed that elderly people were taken out of hospital and put into care homes without being tested. But First Minister, can you confirm if it was the case that even people who were ill and displaying symptoms of the disease were also removed from hospital and returned to care homes. First Minister. Um, can I firstly say I never forget that when uh, we cite these statistics, we're talking about real people uh, and real individuals. It's something I take at the time and always will do uh, to remember each day when I read out the grim statistics that I require to read out behind each and every one of these statistics as a human being who has been grieved by uh, the loved ones. Um, on the issue uh, at hand, obviously it's, it's not possible for me to comment on individual cases where I don't know uh, the full circumstances, but anybody who has lost a loved one uh, to this virus uh, understandably will have questions and in the fullness of time I think we will want to try to answer all of these questions uh, as far as we possibly can. But I would point Jackson Carlaw to, to the, the guidance that was issued at the time which made clear that clinical risk assessments should be uh, done of patients who were being discharged from hospital. So uh, nobody who had uh, symptoms of uh, coronavirus uh, and certainly nobody uh, where the, the clinical assessment was that they should continue to be in hospital should have been discharged in that way. These are risk assessments that are required to be done by clinicians and professionals, uh, but the guidance that was in place was clear um, and uh, should have uh, been uh, followed as all guidance, uh, whether to, to hospitals or to care homes, uh, should be followed very carefully. Jackson Carlo. Um, thank the First Minister for that. It's not quite clear from that whether people with symptoms uh, may well have been discharged into the hospital, even though there was a clinical assessment made. Were they, if they had symptoms, discharged into the, into the care homes? Sandra's view is clear that unwell elderly people, in her own words, should never have been sent back to care homes. 
Now, we've read press reports in April that five residents have died in this particular care home, although Mrs O'Neill has said she believes it is now more than that, and that there was little or no attempt to isolate residents who were then returned from hospital. As she maintains, she says the frontline care staff in the home did everything they could for her mother. They were not to blame for what happened. But there is a growing feeling that residents like Sandra's mother were treated like second-class citizens. Can the First Minister give a clear commitment that the situation at Almond Court will be examined in full and that other residents and their families who remain worried about their own relatives will be better treated? First Minister. Um, the Care Inspectorate has a duty on an ongoing basis to make sure that concerns around any care home are, are properly considered and that standards at care homes are as uh, residents themselves and their families have a right to expect. Um, on the two uh, specific issues that Jackson Carlaw uh, raises, I, I think I was clear uh, that the guidance in place uh, is, is very clear that uh, patients should have been clinically risk assessed, so therefore uh, patients with symptoms should not have been discharged uh, to care homes. Clearly I did not see every uh, patient who was discharged to a care home. I cannot stand here and give a categoric assurance that no patient with symptoms uh, was discharged. It would be wrong for me to do that, but the guidance that was in place was very, very clear. Similarly with uh, isolation, uh, the, the guidance that uh, was issued to care homes uh, in, in March uh, made clear that uh, there should not be communal uh, dining, that there should not be communal activities, that uh, people coming, uh, people in care homes should be isolated in a way that you know, has been hard for, for others, but particularly hard uh, for older people living in care homes. Clearly, uh, while all parts of the system have to work together and are working together, uh, the primary responsibility is for care home providers to make sure that guidance is being followed. And I would continue to expect uh, that that is the case. Um, it is not the case. And this is, this is the issue I do take exception to. Uh, we have learned about this virus all along. We have had to adapt our approaches as we do, but at no point uh, were older people treated like second-class citizens. At no point was anything other than the greatest care and attention and thought given to the decisions that were being taken and the guidance that was being put in place. And that will continue to be the case every single step of the way. Jackson Carroll. Uh, with or without hindsight, it is now clear that what happened in our care homes in March and April was a national scandal. On Monday, the First Minister said that undoubtedly there will be an inquiry or inquiries into all aspects of this pandemic, and I think that's right and proper. Care homes will be part of that review. The scale of what had happened and what we know to have been so far 1,749 deaths and the tragic stories of people like Sandra and her mother underline the need not just for a review, but for a formal public inquiry into what has happened in our care homes specifically. Will the First Minister agree to confirm today that she will, in due course, instruct that formal public inquiry into the care home sector? First Minister. Uh, of course there will be a public inquiry into uh, this uh, whole crisis and every aspect of that crisis, and that will undoubtedly include uh, what happened in care homes. Decisions were taken for uh, the best of reasons based on the best evidence. There were similar decisions taken in Scotland to uh, those that were taken uh, around care homes in, in England, uh, Wales, and as far as I am aware, in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, those decisions, particularly around delayed discharge, were communicated very clearly to this parliament by the health secretary. This is not something that was done uh, without proper uh, transparency and notification in, in the normal way. Um, and we will look back on all of this and uh, learn a lot. Uh, nobody uh, or few people uh, want to make sure we learn all appropriate lessons more than I do. But throughout this crisis, I've taken uh, the best decisions I can at every step of the way, based on the best information and the evidence I had at the time. All of these decisions have been tough. Some have been really tough, but I've not shied away from taking them, nor will I ever shy away from uh, being candid about mistakes or instances where, had I known uh, then what I know now, I may have come to different conclusions. But that, presiding officer, is what leadership means. You have to make the tough calls when they fall to be made. You can't hide away uh, with your head down, hoping that it all goes away. And I hope uh, Jackson Carlow and others will reflect on that. Now call Richard Leonard. Uh, back on the 5th of March, I asked the First Minister about the challenge of delayed discharge in light of COVID-19. We now know the government rushed to discharge almost 1,000 vulnerable patients from hospital in the month of March alone. And we have now seen the devastating consequences in Scotland's care homes. 
The First Minister told me at the time there would be, and I quote, an intensive focus on ensuring that we can discharge people appropriately. But right up until the 22nd of April, Scottish Government guidance on the discharge of patients from hospital into care homes stated that, and I quote, individuals being discharged from hospital do not routinely need confirmation of a negative COVID-19 test. Just yesterday, a nurse working at a care home in Lanarkshire told me we had several residents who came from hospital. None of them knew they were going to a nursing home. So when they arrived, we contacted their next of kin, who didn't know they were going to a nursing home either. It was all one big mess. Does the First Minister accept now that her intention of discharging people appropriately was not met? And can she explain why she allowed it to remain in place for so long? First Minister. We have adapted our approach as the evidence and the information that we have had has developed. Richard Leonard talks about uh, what Gaiden said previously around tests. Uh, now, yes, we uh, now have different uh, advice around testing asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people. But at that time, uh, there were two things that were different. Firstly, uh, there was uh, a view that it was not likely that people without symptoms would spread the virus. And secondly, there was a concern about the lack of re reliability uh, of testing people without symptoms. Now, that latter point still exists to some extent. So we have developed our approach to testing and to other things as the evidence and the advice has changed. I cannot. And Richard Leonard says that he uh, was talking about delayed discharge in early March in here the fact that he wasn't raising those specific questions then uh, that he is now it shows that we cannot apply hindsight and change what we knew at, at the time we can only operate on the basis of what uh, we knew and operate with absolutely the best of intentions and I would challenge uh, Richard Leonard when he said we we rushed to discharge uh, patients from hospital uh, and make two points uh, to him that I've made before firstly um, in normal times, remember, uh, Richard Leonard and others rightly are usually standing up here criticising the Scottish Government for not reducing delayed discharge because these are older people that have no medical need to be in hospital and being in hospital is not in their interest. And secondly, uh, yes, I, I, I regret uh, more than Richard Leonard might uh, ever be able to know every single uh, person who has lost their life in a care home as a result of this virus. But again, this is where the hindsight point comes in. Had we not tried to get older people out of hospital, they would have potentially been exposed to the virus in hospitals, and many of them would have died in those circumstances. And Richard Leonard would undoubtedly be standing here, or others would be standing here, saying to me, with the benefit of hindsight, why didn't we try to get older people out of hospital? Now, the point I am making is that there are no easy choices when you face these decisions. What you have to do is make the decisions based on the best evidence and information you had. That's what we did there, putting in place the guidance that I've already spoken about, and we've continued to adapt our approach as our knowledge it has developed. And that's what we will continue to do every single step of the way. And we will continue to be, as we have been all along, open and transparent with this parliament about the decisions we are taking and the reasons why we are taking them. Richard Leonard. Well, I have said, and we have said repeatedly, you should listen to the World Health Organization, which said test, test, test. And it's been saying that since March. So um, sadly, the result is the consequences we see in our residential care homes. The crisis in our care homes may be linked to the release of those hospital patients who had not been screened, but has not, this crisis has not stopped there. Every day, the government's data shows that there are more new COVID-19 infections in even more care homes. It now stands at over 5,500. That's as many as one in six residents, with over 60% of all care homes in Scotland reporting at least one case. So let's be, let's be absolutely clear, this crisis is not yet under control. Last week, the Scottish Government announced regular testing for care home staff. But the Royal College of Nursing is warning today that Scotland is lagging behind. 
So can I once again ask the First Minister how many care home staff and residents have now been tested and when will all those staff finally have access to regular testing? First Minister. Uh, testing of care home staff will be an ongoing process because it's not enough uh, to do it once, we have to do it regularly and we will publish data as we have published data uh, on testing uh, as we, we go along when we are certain that that data is robust and, and able to be published. I would caution um, against making comparisons between uh, Scotland's testing and figures that are being uh, published UK-wide. Uh, it's not for me to uh, go into detail about those statistics, but I am certain in the, the validity and the robustness of the data that is being published uh, in, in Scotland. Uh, and of course, uh, we, you know, th this is not political in any uh, way, shape or form. You know, I uh, talk about these issues regularly with uh, Richard Leonard's colleague, the First Minister of Wales, where we are all uh, grappling with these issues uh, and basing our decisions on the best evidence uh, that is available. On the issue of uh, the, the current situation in care homes, I would never describe uh, this crisis generally or specifically in relation to care homes uh, yet as being under control. We have a long way to go. But in point of fact, uh, both in terms of the number of uh, care homes uh, with an active case, the percentage of care homes with an active case and, and the, the new cases we're seeing reported every day, as well as the number of deaths, we are seeing all of these uh, decline. So in today's figures, which uh, obviously will be published uh, at two o'clock, uh, the increase in uh, cumulative cases in care homes increased uh, from the, the previous day uh, by 60, which is a much lower number than we've seen uh, previously. So uh, we will continue uh, for as long as uh, this uh, virus is a threat to take the right decisions based on the evidence and the knowledge that we have got. These are uh, all horrendously difficult decisions because all of us understand and I absolutely understand uh, the consequences of all of these decisions, uh, which is why they have to be taken with such care, thought and attention. And as far as I'm concerned, they absolutely always will be uh, with complete focus on doing the right thing as best we can at every stage. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Look, the situation is urgent. So it's not a matter of about whether it's politics or not, it's the urgency of it. And as we start to see an easing of the lockdown, the human rights and the dignity of care home residents must be paramount. There is a basic duty of care which a government has to its most vulnerable citizens. So those residents will need continued protection. That means widespread and regular testing of staff. That means adequate PPE, and it means true transparency. We know, we know that flawed government guidance led to the discharge of untested patients into care homes. And we know that flawed government guidance meant that care home residents were not transferred into hospitals when they were ill. We cannot make the same mistakes again. This time, the guidance must be right. So will the First Minister today commit to an urgent review of her government's approach to care homes so that lessons can be learned and action can be taken quickly as we begin to ease the lockdown? First well, Minister. As I said previously, not only do I expect, I absolutely want there to be a, a review, inquiry, call it what you want, into every aspect of this crisis. That is vitally important for accountability, but also for learning lessons uh, for the future. Um, and that will undoubtedly include uh, what uh, the situation was in, in care homes. But if Richard Leonard will forgive me, right now, my focus is on continuing to do uh, everything we need to do uh, for the remainder of this crisis. We are not through this crisis yet. We are not even through this phase of this crisis yet. And therefore, my responsibility as First Minister uh, and the responsibility of every one of my ministers is to make sure we focus on the decisions that still fall to be taken, learning the lessons uh, and applying the knowledge that we have at the time. When Richard Leonard calls the guidance flawed, what he is doing um, and he's entitled to do it. I, I, you know, this is fair enough, but I, I think it is reasonable for me to point out what he is doing is taking knowledge we have now that we did not have at the time and applying that retrospectively. Now, um, I wish I had the benefit when I took these decisions of, of foresight uh, about changing circumstances so that I could apply it then. But we have to take decisions based on what we know then. And Richard Leonard says that these things are urgent. And trust me, you know, whatever else you want to, to criticise, which is absolutely legitimate, scrutiny is really important, which I've said all along. Uh, but I don't 
don't think you have to tell me about the urgency of this. Literally every waking moment of mine, of the health secretaries, of the whole government right now, and there are plenty of these waking, waking moments right now, uh, are spent on trying to do the best thing to deal with this crisis. And that will continue to be the case for as long as we are facing it. Now call Alison Johnson. Thank you, presiding officer. From tomorrow, test and protect will finally be ruled out, though I deeply regret contact tracing was abandoned in the first place. Going into isolation for two weeks, particularly when there are no symptoms, is necessary, but it is a big ask. This week's news has been dominated by the failure of a wealthy and powerful individual to self-isolate, but imagine the difficulties faced by those who are not privileged. For the self-employed and those in precarious work, isolation may be unaffordable. For those who share their homes with families or others, isolation may be impossible. For the sole carer of a loved one, isolation may be heartbreaking. So can the First Minister outline what support will be made available to those who need to isolate? For example, will accommodation like hotel rooms be offered free to those who need them? Thank you. First Minister. Um, in uh, short answer to that question, yes, um, we issued guidance yesterday, um, issued guidance to employers uh, around our expectations of employers. We're also uh, in ongoing discussions with the UK government around uh, changes that may be needed to benefits, uh, to statutory sick pay, uh, to make sure that people don't uh, lose income. Uh, and we also issued guidance uh, to individuals about you know, what they could perhaps do to prepare in advance for potential periods of isolation, but also on the support that will be available to them. Um, that support um, will uh, be provided uh, largely using the kind of infrastructure we've put in place to give support to those in the shielded group, and that could uh, be support accessing food uh, and medicine if there are no family uh, members that are able to do that, or it could be in extremists, uh, support with alternative accommodation. It is absolutely the case that we will require to make sure that anybody who has been asked to go in, into a period of isolation for 14 days gets the support that they need to do it. But can I make a really important point here that I, I, I fear will be lost as we move to test and protect, which is obviously very important. Uh, and my biggest fear about it is that we all think we, we, we we can stop doing all the other things we've been doing because test and protect is some kind of system there that will keep us safe from this virus regardless of what we do. If you don't want to face a period of self-isolation, then the best way to uh, minimise that risk is not to become the close contact of somebody outside your own household. So if you take care not to be within two metres of somebody outside your household, then you are minimising your risk of ever being in the position of getting that phone call from a contact tracer and being advised to self-isolate. And if all of us continue to uh, follow that advice of staying two metres apart from others out with our own households, then collectively we keep this virus suppressed. So test and protect is really important, but fundamentally how we stop this virus spreading is down to us and our own behaviour and reducing the number of bridges we give it to, to jump over. And that means physical distancing continues to be really important. And actually, as we start to ease some of the lockdown measures, becomes more important than ever. Alison Johnson. Thank the First Minister for that response. Um, Test and Protect will have a particular impact on frontline staff and their families. A report yesterday linked 24 members of medical staff at the Western General Hospital contracting the virus with the admission of just one patient. We need to do more to suppress the spread of the virus in hospitals to protect patients, staff and their families. It's been over a month since I started calling for regular routine testing for NHS workers on the front line, but we've had little movement, even though too much of our capacity remains unused. So can the First Minister tell us whether regular testing in hospitals will be introduced alongside Test and Protect? Thank you. First Minister. Uh, that is something we continue to uh, take clinical advice on and we will make decisions on that uh, in due course. Um, but on the issue of hospital transmission, nosocomial infection as, as it's called, uh, there is a, a huge amount of work, not just in Scotland, but across the UK and globally to better understand that uh, when somebody uh, test positive or is confirmed as having uh, the, the virus in a hospital, it cannot automatically be assumed that they got it in the hospital because of the often lengthy incubation periods. Uh, we established a, a nosocomial advisory group um, 
some weeks ago uh, to identify additional interventions to reduce in-hospital transmission. Uh, Health Protection Scotland is working uh, with UK uh, counterparts on these issues as well. Testing uh, will undoubtedly be a part of that, but there's a whole range of things around infection prevention and control, uh, including cohorting of patients where appropriate, that also it continues to be important as well. Call Willie Rennie. We need to speak with one voice. What Dominic Cummings did was wrong. The Prime Minister was wrong to defend him. They are treating people like mugs. This is wrong and we should condemn it. Everyone should condemn it. Can I ask the First Minister about the legal tourist industry? The precautionary approach will mean a longer lockdown for the sector. The industry is anxious that this could obliterate its summer season and that many businesses will collapse without additional support, resulting in thousands of jobs lost. The UK government has extended the furlough scheme. Will the Scottish government extend its grant scheme too to avoid that business collapse? First Minister. Um, well, firstly, can I say um, on Dominic Cummings, I've, I've made my views clear. I think it was wrong. I think the Prime Minister is wrong uh, to defend it in the way he has done, principally because it has involved a, a retrospective rewriting of the rules, which undermines confidence in the rules and the guidance that remains so important. But, you know, I don't want to be standing here talking um, about that. I, my job is to make sure that I get a message across to the Scottish people that what we are asking you to do is important, not just because you're being told to do it, it's important for your own protection and the protection of your loved ones. And I think uh, that is the one voice that I hope all of us speak uh, with in the, the weeks to come. Um, on the, the tourist sector, Willie Rennie is right, um, of uh, all of the sectors, and there's not a sector in the Scottish economy that hasn't been hit by this virus, but there are some that have been hit harder than others, and tourism is uh, one that will both have been hit hardest and potentially have the, the longest lasting uh, impact. Uh, these are issues that the Scottish Government is actively considering, uh, both in terms of the, uh, the, the grant support and what happens to that in future, and we'll take decisions on that in due course. But we are also looking carefully at the ways in which the tourist uh, industry may be able to resume activities in a safe way. Fergus Ewing has been leading work there, and the, uh, I chair every Friday morning a, a subcommittee of the Cabinet looking specifically at the economic issues, and this is uh, one that we are uh, due to look at in detail shortly. So these are issues uh, absolutely at uh, the top of our minds and we will take careful decisions uh, trying to make sure that at all stages uh, as much support as possible is in place for businesses that have been affected. Willie Rennie. I think that's right because the, the support mechanisms, the financial support mechanisms need to match the lockdown mechanisms as well. Now many students work in the tourism sector over the summer months but if the industry does not reopen they will be without an income. Award agencies normally only provide financial support on a term time basis. So student leaders like Jamie Rodney at St Andrews are leading a campaign to extend SAS grant payments over the summer months. The campaign has the support of sensible MSPs from across the parliament, people like Bob Doris and Bruce Crawford, Polly McNeil, Andy Whiteman and Keith Brown are all behind it. So will the first minister get behind it too and provide financial support for students over the summer. First Minister. Uh, we will look very carefully at that as we are looking very carefully at all suggestions that are made about how we mitigate the impact of this on businesses and on individuals. Um, I hope Willie Rennie will appreciate it. I'm not going to stand here and give categoric assurances on things while we're still going through that process of consideration because uh, there are many good suggestions being made right now. Uh, I would love to be able to agree to all of them, but we have to make careful decisions, bearing in mind that there is a, a limit on the financial resources that we are able to bring to bear, but we will do as much uh, as we, we possibly can. Uh, I recognise in a whole range of ways students uh, will be uh, affected uh, by this given the, the nature of some of the industries uh, that will have the, the longest lasting impact but uh, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that we want to try to get uh, businesses in all sectors operational to a greater or lesser extent as soon as possible. It's got to be done safely and that's a, a big focus of, of the work that uh, Fiona Hislop is leading overall uh, right now but we do want to see as, as much economic activity uh, resume as quickly as possible consistent with continuing to suppress the virus because if we take our, our eye off that then the, the damage to the economy will be even deeper and longer lasting than it is currently estimated to be. 
And question number five is from Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government has had any discussions with the Treasury regarding Project Birch, the plan to assist struggling companies of strategic importance. First Minister. Uh, we're in discussion with the UK Government about uh, a whole range of matters uh, right now, as uh, members would expect, uh, and we're very clear that more support for the economy will be required, both from the UK Government and indeed from the Scottish Government, so I welcome the indication that they are prepared to provide support for large companies if failure would, uh, and I'm quoting now, disproportionately harm the UK economy. To date, uh, the Scottish Government has not been involved in uh, specific discussions with the Treasury regarding that particular initiative, although we will uh, seek to be over the days to come and we would expect the UK Government to share more details of this project with us, particularly where the businesses that uh, they are looking at as possible recipients for this kind of support are critical to the Scottish economy. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that response and whilst the Chancellor believes the UK Government should act to save companies as failure would, as the First Minister herself has just said, disproportionately harm the economy, he is thinking in UK terms this project Birch might not apply to companies of vital importance to Scotland not considered strategic at UK level. Does the First Minister agree that the Chancellor should provide both the resources and flexibility to the Scottish Government to allow it to support the continued survival, recovery and growth of Scotland's strategically important companies channelled through the Scottish Investment Bank? And does she agree the Chancellor should make good on £60 million in Barnet consequentials promised on the 2nd of May to assist businesses which, with £10 million previously pledged for charities and in clear breach of faith, will not now be forthcoming? First Minister. Um, on that latter point, I think it is really important um, that every penny of consequentials that has been promised and committed actually materialises because we have and we've been challenged uh, rightly by uh, members across the chamber to give a commitment ourselves to pass on every penny of consequentials to businesses or to, to other uh, interests. We have done that uh, and therefore it would be a, a serious concern right now if all of that money uh, doesn't materialise. So I would uh, absolutely uh, say to the Treasury to please uh, make good on these commitments so that we can make good uh, to the commitments we've made to, to businesses and others across Scotland. Um, on the Project uh, Birch uh, question, as I indicated in my initial answer. It is vital that support is there for companies that are of importance uh, to the UK, but also for companies that are important to Scotland. Now, in some cases, these will be the same companies, um, and we and our enterprise agencies will work with the UK government through Project Birch to support them. However, that might not always be the case, and the Scottish government needs the resources and the flexibility to support those companies that make a critical contribution to the Scottish economy and indeed to uh, parts of Scotland like Ayrshire. Uh, our enterprise agencies continue to work with a range of companies to provide appropriate support within the resources we have available, uh, but it's important that these UK-wide schemes take account of the particular considerations in the Scottish economy, and we'll continue to discuss that with the UK Government. Question number six, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to Police Scotland reporting that nearly 1,700 cases have been recorded under the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act. First Minister. Uh, I should point out that these figures are provisional, but nevertheless, I welcome the early indication that the new domestic abuse laws are encouraging victims to come forward and report these crimes while providing officers with greater powers to target those who abuse their partner or ex-partner. Police Scotland remains committed to tackling domestic abuse and more than 14,000 officers and staff have received specialist training to spot the signs of coercive and controlling behaviour. It remains a priority that victims of domestic abuse get the support they need, particularly during these uh, challenging times, and that they're kept safe from harm. That's why we've provided additional funding of over £1.5 million to the sector and published guidance with COSLA for local authorities on responding effectively to domestic abuse. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for that response. This indicates that the fact that, sadly, private spaces are not safe places for everyone. The stay-at-home guidelines also exposes individuals to greater harm or risk of abuse or neglect. We also know, First Minister, that many incidents go underreported. Therefore, what further action can the Scottish Government take to encourage victims of domestic violence or domestic abuse to seek the support and assistance that they require? First Minister. Well, these are really uh, important issues. Um, I think they're important issues at all times, but particularly, as the member rightly said, when we are asking people to stay at home um, and 
Uh, we recognise that private spaces and people's own homes are often not safe places and can be some of the most dangerous places that people uh, can be in. That's why we have uh, provided extra funding to organisations in the sector so that, for example, the National Helpline uh, can continue to be operational during this crisis. Um, and we have taken lots of opportunities to uh, advertise and market the availability of that kind of support that, so that people uh, know that it is there. And we will continue to do that um, as, as we go through this crisis and indeed beyond. There is also, of course, in the coronavirus uh, regulations, the, the, the safeguarding uh, provision about people fleeing domestic abuse and I'm not making uh, a political point here, but it is really important that people understand that that is there and why that is there, which is another reason uh, that we shouldn't sort of uh, redefine uh, some of these rules uh, in current circumstances, because it's really important that people understand what they are uh, and why they are as they are. Question number seven, Jackie Bailey. When the Scottish Government will commence its review of care homes? First Minister. Well, as I've said already uh, today, I have no doubt that at an appropriate time when we've dealt with the immediacy of this crisis, there will be inquiries and reviews into how uh, governments have handled it. Uh, there is, as I've also uh, commented on, a reality of hindsight that allows people to look at decisions taken in the past and apply knowledge uh, of the virus that we only have now. But what we uh, did and will always do is take the right decisions based on the best information we have and adapt those decisions as new information uh, changes uh, what we know. Uh, we announced new arrangements to significantly strengthen oversight of Scotland's care homes uh, earlier in May. That involves clinical and care professionals undertaking targeted reviews of and support for all care homes. Uh, prior to COVID, we had started to look at ways to improve care home sustainability. Uh, that was part of our adult social care reform programme, uh, which the Health Secretary launched with COSLA last year. We will use the learning from the COVID pandemic to identify what this means for the future of care home provision, for example, uh, how it is organised in the future and how it is funded. Jackie Bailey. Can I thank the First Minister for that response? Transferring older people from hospitals to care homes without testing, the lack of PPE, the slow provision of testing for staff has contributed to care homes being the epicentre of COVID-19. So I welcome an inquiry but I also welcome a separate review of care homes, which appeared to be announced by the Health Secretary a few days ago. But the Scottish Government have been here before. Let me refresh the First Minister's memory, because there was a ministerial task force for the future of residential care for older people, which reported in February 2014. It contained 34 recommendations. But let me ask the First Minister, how many of these recommendations were actually implemented? particularly the recommendations on managing risk and care home governance. I am told by social care professionals that it is only a handful. So First Minister, what is the point in having a review if you fail to implement the recommendations? First Minister. Um, on the specific question, I will uh, happily write to Jackie Bailey uh, with a, a detailed answer. I don't have that information in front of me right now. Jackie Bailey, of course, uh, understands and, and knows, as all members do, uh, the uh, variety of work that has been done around social care, not least the integration of health and social care over uh, these uh, years. And it is important that we learn from uh, this crisis uh, and uh, consider uh, afresh, based on what we uh, know and have learned uh, throughout it what the future of uh, the care home sector might be longer term. But again, as I, I think I said to Richard Leonard, uh, my job right now is to focus on the crisis in front of us and to make sure we continue to take the best decisions we can based on the best evidence. We will have time for reviews and inquiries and I will uh, welcome those uh, and I mean that sincerely, but I am not going to take my eye off the ball uh, of dealing with what lies in front of us because it is still a serious concern uh, for people across Scotland, indeed for people across the globe. We'll now move on to supplementary questions. I have a lot of requests and we'll run till half past one. Uh, so if people could try to be succinct, it would help. I have Liam Kerr to be followed by Colin Beattie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Our offshore oil and gas industry has continued to operate since the lockdown began. However, Oil and Gas UK have made clear to me this week that in order to return to pre-COVID manning levels, asymptomatic testing is essential. They tell me that they've made a strong case to get the asymptomatic workforce tested as long as it has no impact on NHS staff and frontline care workers. Could the First Minister update Parliament as to when they can expect asymptomatic testing to start and what has been the hold-up? 
First Minister. I, I, I'm pretty sure Liam Kerr has uh, heard me many, many times, because I know I've said it many, many times, talk about the, the issues around testing of asymptomatic people. We, because we have more evidence about asymptomatic transmission, uh, we are uh, continuing, uh, we are expanding testing of those, but we have been focusing on uh, care home uh, workers uh, and residents uh, in particular. Of course, all uh, key workers that are uh, part of the critical infrastructure of the country uh, have access to uh, testing when they are symptomatic and indeed their wider families do but we will continue to uh, have an approach to testing that is based on evidence and advice uh, both on the clinical benefits but also on the efficacy of the testing and we will continue to keep parliament updated Colin Beattie to be followed by Alec Rowley can I ask the first minister what clarity the devolved administrations have received from the UK government regarding the receipt of funding consequentials following the extension to business grants? Uh, well, First Minister. We obviously have the, uh, the details that the UK government have announced publicly um, around consequentials, um, and we have given commitments on the strength of those public announcements to pass on every single penny. But as uh, Kerry Gibson alluded to in his question earlier on, there have been suggestions more recently that uh, elements of that consequential funding will not materialise and that if there are underspends at a UK level in some of that funding, then that may be clawed back. And um, we don't yet have certainty or absolute clarity on that, but these issues uh, will be followed up uh, assiduously uh, and vigorously by uh, the Finance Secretary. Um, and I would hope that all members across uh, the Chamber will join with us and uh, making clear to the UK government that there is an expectation that consequentials that have been announced will flow through uh, in full because we have committed them and therefore if the UK government claw them back we are left in the invidious position of not being able to honour the commitments we've given and I don't think anybody across the chamber would want us to be in that position. Alec Rowley followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, I have a young 18-year-old constituent who has been ordered by a Scottish court to travel to Malta with her baby due to legal decisions of the Scottish court. I'm not asking the First Minister to comment on the legal case itself, but rather whether she thinks it is right that a vulnerable young individual with her child can be forced to travel abroad to an uncertain future, not knowing if she and her child will be safe in the middle of a global pandemic. And will she agree to have a look at this case? First Minister. Um, can I say to Alec Rowley that I, uh, on the, the limited information I have about this case, I, I absolutely share the concerns and share the, the sympathy uh, with uh, those who find themselves in this uh, position. Uh, but I, I'm sure Alec Rowley will understand that I cannot intervene uh, in what was a, a judicial uh, decision. Um, that obviously would interfere with the independence of the judiciary. In Scotland, all applications for a return order under the 1980 Convention go to the Court of Session and are heard by one of two uh, judges. Uh, the evidence uh, from both parties, as I understand it, was heard in this case and uh, a decision was uh, made. Um, therefore, while I can uh, sympathise with the, the consequences of that, it would be you know, completely wrong for me to say anything uh, that interfered with the, the independence of the process. And I, I hope Alec Rowley will understand that position. Mike Rumbles to be followed by Emma Harper. I've received many emails from constituents who have unnecessarily suffered because they thought they were following the rules of lockdown and now find the rules allow them the exemptions they needed. They were unaware of the detail of the legislation we passed together unanimously in this chamber, listing over 20 exemptions, and that list, of course, is not exhaustive. The First Minister, and I say this for understandable reasons, simplifies the regulations in her addresses to the nation. As MSPs, we know the detail of the regulations in the legislation, but the public do not know. So how will the First Minister address this very real problem? First Minister. Uh, I will try to do what I've tried to do every single day throughout this crisis, is give uh, clear and uh, straightforward uh, advice to the, the public. Um, you know, the, the regulations, as, as 
uh, Ali, uh, sorry, Mike Rumbles uh, has said, we're passed by the Parliament. All MSPs have a, an obligation to answer questions from their constituents and make sure the detail of what is passed is, is understood. Uh, the most important uh, message I have had to get across, given what we uh, have been facing, uh, has been the stay at home uh, message with the exceptions uh, that we talk about uh, on, on a regular basis. But I will always try in uh, every way that I have at my disposal to deepen people's understanding uh, of, of what we're asking them to do, uh, because that becomes more important as we start to ease these lockdown measures, because it will become more nuanced and people's judgment will uh, be uh, called on much more perhaps than it has been in the past. So I, I will always try to do that, and I know MSPs will always try to do likewise. I'm afraid, oh, we do have Ms Harper with us now, just in the nick of time. So I call Emma Harper to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the latest report on the impact of minimum unit pricing? First Minister. Um, I welcome the latest report which evaluates the impact of minimum minimum unit pricing which shows that small convenience uh, store retailers feel uh, sales of those drinks most affected by the policy have fallen. Uh, these findings confirm a high compliance uh, with minimum unit pricing and show that these retailers have experienced little or no adverse effects from the introdu introduction of the policy with many reporting that they can now compete better with supermarkets on price. A report in June last year also showed a 3% decrease in the volume of pure alcohol sold per adult in the off-trade in Scotland in 2018, which is encouraging. Now, uh, for all of that, we know it will take longer for the impact of reduced consumption to feed through into alcohol-related harms, but the evidence we do have uh, so far is extremely encouraging. Jamie Green, to be followed by Neil Bibby. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this Friday is the deadline for the submission of uh, grade estimates for for teachers. Um, a number of people have been in touch with me this week with concerns, specifically those who are uh, sitting exams external of uh, registered bodies, those who have been undergoing homeschooling or those who are undergoing retakes. Uh, one candidate has been told that the SQA will not accept coursework unless it comes through a registered body such as a school, but that's not always possible for every candidate. Can I ask the First Minister to press upon the education sector to look into this specific cohort of people? and issue urgent advice to them ahead of this Friday's deadline, and also to ensure that the appeals process will be robust, transparent and fair. First Minister. Uh, on that latter point, yes, uh, that should always be the case with an appeals process. On the, the uh, first point that the member raises, yes, I will raise it with the Education Secretary uh, later uh, this afternoon, uh, but if he is willing to send me details of the concerns that he has had expressed to him, I will make sure that they are answered in full, and that if there is a need for further guidance to be issued, that that happens quickly. Neil Bibby, to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Thank you, President Officer. Plans by Rolls-Royce to slash 9,000 jobs globally will have a severe impact on their site at Inchinnan, which employs over 1,000 people and supports much of Scotland's aerospace sector. If jobs go at Rolls-Royce, workers fear they may never return. I welcome the update from the Business Minister, but may I ask the First Minister to outline what steps the Scottish Government can take to prevent these job losses and to ensure that Nshin and workers can benefit from the economic recovery when it comes? And will she agree that there must be strategic investment in the sector to save jobs and prevent irreparable damage to the Scottish economy? First Minister. Um, uh, yes, I do agree with that. And I agree and sympathise with the the general sentiment of the question that's been asked. Um, as Neil Bibby, I know, is aware, we are actively engaging with Rolls-Royce to try to uh, minimise any redundancies, but also to do everything we can to secure the continued presence uh, of Rolls-Royce, because it's important uh, for its own sake in terms of the employment that is dependent on it, but in terms of uh, our manufacturing uh, footprint it is important for a wider strategic interest as well. So we see it very much in that strategic uh, context as well as for, from the, the perspective of the individuals who, who work there. We'll continue to keep him and other members updated as these discussions uh, continue, uh, but we will be doing everything we can uh, to secure the outcomes that I'm sure Neil Bibby uh, will want us to. Andy Whiteman to be followed by Sandra White. Thanks, Presiding Officer. I welcome Scottish Government's support for new active travel choices through the Spaces for People Fund, which was expanded uh, yesterday. And of course, it's up to local authorities to develop projects that are appropriate to, this area, to their areas. But I have a constituent in Midlothian who's been campaigning for a, 
uh, a quiet route from Pathhead to Dalkeith with very little support from Midlothian Council. Does she agree that all councils should be embracing the opportunities provided by the fund and taking seriously uh, proposals that come forward that meet the criteria? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do agree with that in general, but uh, obviously local authorities then have to look at applications and apply the criteria and come to decisions, and I cannot uh, second-guess all of these decisions. And while I'm sure there is a, a very strong case to be made for the route that Andy Whiteman talks about, the, uh, if I heard it correctly, Pathhead to, to Midlothian, that is uh, for the local council there to determine. But this is important additional funding. Um, I think support for active travel, which is always important becomes more important as we will uh, be encouraging fewer people to use public transport for the foreseeable uh, future, uh, then it's really important that councils take these decisions as quickly as possible and applying these criteria, criteria as fairly as they possibly can. Sandra White to be followed by Myers-Briggs. Uh, thank you very much, presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister uh, what is being done to encourage people to access mental health support and in particular, older people who are shielding. First Minister. Well, again, uh, we, we've made uh, significant uh, additional funding available uh, for mental health support, um, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, we've also uh, had uh, particular uh, public awareness campaigns, the Clear Your Head campaign, for example, to, to make people uh, aware of where they can get that kind of support, uh, and we'll continue to do that as well. So we've invested in... Uh, increased capacity through the NHS 24 helpline, for example, and through other uh, routes, and uh, we'll take steps to make sure that people know where to go. Uh, of course, all of uh, this kind of information about what is available is, uh, can be accessed by people um, on the NHS Inform website, where they'll find different routes to get support uh, at what is a very difficult time for people, uh, not just uh, in terms of the challenges for physical health, but the challenges uh, that many are facing to their mental health and well-being as well. So this is one of the most important issues uh, that we're dealing with not just just now but we'll have to continue to deal with as we we recover uh, from the crisis that we faced in recent weeks miles briggs followed by monica lennon thank you presiding officer in february 236 patients were classified as delayed discharge patients due to not having a power of attorney in place many had been in uh, the situation for months can the first minister say today how many patients with no power of attorney, um, were discharged during the crisis. What legal framework have Scottish Government used to take any decisions to move individuals to care homes? And what assessment of these individuals' human rights have ministers undertaken? Um, given, the importance of this issue, given the importance of this issue, I will give a, a full um, reply in, in writing to Miles Briggs with the detail uh, of, of the questions that he has asked. Um, it's really important then that when people are in the situation that he uh, identifies that you know, generally speaking, people are not discharged without power of attorney and that the proper legal steps are taken. But he's asked me some very specific questions there that I don't have the information to hand on. So I'll write to him uh, with the answers as soon as possible. Monica Lennon, followed by Graeme Simpson. Thank you, presiding officer. Care workers weren't relying on hindsight at the beginning of this crisis when they were speaking out about PPE and testing. And worryingly, frontline staff and families continue to raise the alarm. And it's in response to such concerns that I have referred White Hills Care Home and East Kilbride to the care inspectorate this week. Tragically, 23 residents have died at the care home so far as a result of COVID-19. And currently, at least a dozen residents are infected. Dozens of staff at the home have tested positive. I'm grateful to the, the Health Secretary for her speedy written response, which I received this morning, supporting my call for an urgent review. But can I ask the First Minister to provide an update on the reported discrepancy that the BBC raised with her last week about NHS Lanarkshire not testing asymptomatic care home staff when the guidance changed on the 1st of May and has this been an issue in any other health board and finally does she agree with me that asymptomatic transmission is a serious risk in our care homes and, it, and wouldn't it be safer if the guidance was changed to ensure that anyone working in a care home or working there is issued with PPE or at least a face covering because the, the crisis in our care homes is far from over first minister. 
First Minister. Uh, well, on PPE, everybody should have the PPE that they need and the guidance that was uh, changed some weeks back now across all four nations with expert and, and clinical input uh, said that, of course, it should ultimately be down to the risk assessment of the individual uh, staff member about whether or not and, and in what circumstances they should be wearing PPE. Any staff member who feels that they need PPE should have it. In terms of uh, the, the provision and supply of that, the principal responsibility is on care home providers, but we have, uh, since the start of this crisis, put in top-up arrangements uh, if any care home providers are finding it difficult to get what they need through their normal supply rates, uh, routes and of course we have uh, developed new distribution routes to get PPE as quickly as possible uh, to staff so you know, let me be very clear about that. On the uh, issue of the care inspectorate, the care inspectorate uh, has a responsibility to look into and address any issues of concern and I think it would be uh, inappropriate for me to comment in detail uh, about any uh, work that it is doing in relation to any individual individual care home, uh, but it's important, as we've seen in other contexts recently, that where steps need to be taken, uh, the care inspector that takes those uh, and has the protection of residents uppermost in its mind at all times. Graham Simpson to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you. Um, we've got 6,000 homes which are uh, nearly completed in Scotland at the moment, um, and the construction sector is waiting to start on uh, rebuilding these homes, but they don't yet know when they can start. I've been contacted by people across the country, customers, and they're the important people, who are waiting to get into their homes, uh, including one man today who was written to by the housing minister and advised to contact the housing uh, charity shelter. All people want to know is when builders can start working again. What's the answer to that? First Minister. Let me make three uh, quick points. Uh, firstly, the important people in the context of this crisis are the, the entire population of Scotland, uh, and the priority is to keep people as safe as possible from a virus that we know from the evidence and from the discussions we've had even here just today uh, can have a, a potentially deadly uh, impact. So that's got to continue to be uh, our guiding principle in all of this. Second point is in the route map I set out in this chamber, uh, last Thursday, uh, we indicated that phase one, uh, when and if we move into phase one, it uh, will allow the construction sector uh, to implement the, the first uh, two stages of its own restart programme. Um, and that's a, a programme that has been uh, delivered in collaboration uh, between government and the industry. Uh, but the third point is we will make, as I've said uh, previously today, we'll make the formal assessment tomorrow of whether the evidence says it's safe for us to move into phase one. I will set that out tomorrow and I will make clear then what uh, changes in phase one we are prepared to make at that stage uh, which are consistent with trying to get back to as much normality as possible while continuing to suppress the virus. So uh, we will give as much clarity uh, about all of this step by step as we can but we will not and we must not any of us take our eye off that priority of keeping this virus suppressed and not allowing it to get out of control again. Neil Finlay. Um, for years patients have been stuck in hospital uh, and they have been told that their stay in hospital has been delayed because of a care home place not being available or a care package not being available. However, in March, a thousand cases like this were resolved almost overnight, not because new care home rooms were suddenly built or because new staff were recruited overnight, but because money became available to purchase places. So does the First Minister accept that all those delayed discharge patients and their families who for years were told they were delayed because no care home place or no care package was available were in fact misled and that the real reason they were stuck in hospital was because IJBs and councils didn't have the money to purchase the care packages they needed. First Minister. Um, we have to always work within the resources that we have and we do that to the best of our ability and within that we have certainly uh, the government that I now lead have prioritised health and social care all along. We have lived through uh, many years of austerity along the way that has made all of this uh, very difficult. Uh, we have received uh, additional funding through the consequentials uh, route at the start of this crisis to help us deal with the health and social care impacts and we took decisions to try to uh, 
to, to mitigate the impact of that as much as possible. We, we continue to take the best decisions we can uh, based on the best evidence um, and we will continue to do, and I will continue to do that. I will not shy away from doing it, even although I, I often know that whatever decision I take, I will have somebody across this chamber saying it's the wrong one and I should have taken the, the other one. But particularly at times of crisis, the, the job of somebody like me is to take these decisions uh, based on the best evidence we have with the, the resources we have at our disposal and of course be accountable for them. And I will continue to do that uh, every step of the way. That concludes First Minister's questions and we are suspended until half past two.